like usual. Happy Happy Friday, gang! <clears throat> I have I have to be quick since I want to make sure Ashley gets plenty of time. So COVID thing first. Um, well, I got sick last week. Wasn't COVID, but I realized we run out of the COVID test, so I had to go and pay them twenty bucks to the whatever. Uh, but if I were to be a little bit smarter, I would have done the following. Everybody, take a look at the chat. So this is the link you get for free kits. Apparently, it still works. Now, of course, I ordered this post factum, but you know, at least we'll have four. I don't know how often this link can work. Like if you send the order, I don't know, can you send it again in a week? So you get four more, I'm not sure, but it's still, supposedly it still works. Uh, at least that's what my parents told me. That's what they got. Um, all right. Um, and both my parents now have COVID from my brother. Dad is almost recovered. Mom is actually not doing all that great, although I think a little bit better today. So hopefully they'll get better by next week. Okay, so then non-COVID issue for that, I have to share my screen. So this is hot off the press. Um, so this article is in New York Times, I believe today. <laughs> so now I find it really good because it, this is based on, uh, in 2016, the similar article will, was published, I think almost with identical um, um Title and maybe maybe a couple of words were different, but bottom line is so they did this analysis and look at the trend: two thousand seven point four percent of sixty five plus using it. Then this is the one I was quoting: it was three percent. Now it's eight percent. So we have a, a basically a geometrical acceleration, and it's the fastest growing users still sixty five plus. Just to give you a sort of a sense of, um, I mean the the belief is that general public in a younger age, the use is anywhere from 30 to 60%. So if nothing changes, basically older adults will catch up, you know, in in pretty quickly. Cause look, this is only six years and it was a doubling here, or almost tripling actually. So if that's continue, if the trend continue and another tripling will bring it over to all that pretty close to um, other age groups. Um, great article, I just submitted the, um, comment on it hopefully they'll accept it um they didn't select me for this article to interview <clears throat> but hopefully they'll take my comment so that's all i have you know the drill uh well that's quite efficient five minutes um questions in the chat um and then we'll move on to ashley in a couple of minutes yeah so uh correct uh elizabeth actually cdc tells you that there could be expired they they still probably okay. Uh, I've my brother used expired tests. They work just fine. Just you know, if they still give you the uh, test um, control positive, if one if the blue band or whatever that it's set up to be green is positive, it's still working. So you could still use it. And and the fact that the newer variant, some of the newer variants potentially may escape some of this testing, this has nothing to do with expiration. They're gonna expire or unexpired, they'll escape the test anyway. So, okay. Benita currently suffering from the effects of the COVID booster. First day wasn't bad, but fever chills. You, did you do the prep, Benita? Um, or uh, ask is I I want to know. I mean, yeah, there's going to be side effects to some of you from from shots. So, question is how long it's going to last and how bad those side effects are. Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, so I I find that the prep works reasonably well. I mean, I don't know if it's fully gets rid of side effects, but people generally. I've had a few people who who didn't do the prep in the first boosters and then did them later, and they said major difference. Um, I had more than a couple actually. Okay, uh, Linda's asking great question just to me, but I'm going to post this in a general comment. I think it's really a question for Ashley more than for me. Well, I mean it's for both of us, but she's more able to answer that. Oop, that's the wrong. Oh, I can't copy paste from the chat. Oh, okay. So I'm going to say what Linda typed. 
uh, long COVID related questions. Are there specific bacteria that are deficient or over abandoned in long COVID GI issues? If so, are there a way to supplement correct for deficient inflammatory bacterial species? I don't think we know. Uh, that would probably be my kind of <laughs> sad, sad answer. Um, you can make some hypothesis, but the reality is, is probably not. Yeah. Um, and I mean, even if, even if let's say we do find particular specific disturbance, I would say, or dysbiosis, it's not really clear how you're going to fix that. I mean, if you find particular pathologic organism, you know how you can get rid of it. Um, but if you found a deficiency of something, it doesn't mean that you can apply particular probiotics to fix that. So that, that gets us to a general comment. We had a great um, a sound symposium on this topic. And I highly recommend you guys go back there and, and listen to this. And we have some really good speakers, Lead spoke and, and Scott, her husband spoke. And, and there was a lot of sort of biggest concern right now, Linda, is actually quality of those tests. Like nobody fully understands when you get this result, can you rely on any specific information for, to, for a particular uh, species? How accurate are they? Nobody knows. The commercial, currently commercially available tests are, I would say, poorly reliable. That's basically what we know. And, and then so I think a lot of us, when we order those tests in the practice, we just try to get a sense of how significant this general dysbiosis is and what are we going to do about this? I think the bigger great question, and I'll ask this to Ashley, do we actually have capacity to say that in patients with long COVID, there is a dysbiosis, that there is a frequent GI micro, microbiome shifts? And I'm not sure I know. I, you Some know. studies have suggested that that's the case, but I would say that it's probably not in everybody, right? Because long COVID manifests in so many different ways. Um, and what we've seen that even sort of the, um, the biomarkers are different and different manifestations of long COVID. So I would also think that there are some people who have this dysbiosis and some that, that don't, right? So it accounts for maybe some of, some of long COVID, but probably not the whole picture. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's a great topic. Oh, Janet, thanks so much. Janet just posted the link. So highly recommend you guys check that out because I think it is good good source of reliable information. It's very well organized. Okay, um, let's do one more question um, and then we'll move on. So um, Elizabeth, thanks for sharing that, that you had minimal side effects um, for, with the prep. Thank you. Yeah, so CJ, I think that's why I always stand my ground and saying, try not to mix vaccines. Um, the fact that, uh, like say CDC says, it's okay to combine flu and COVID, they may say that because when they look at massive amount of databases, they see a washout of the negative impact. But you know, I just, just it's like, why would you do that? Like, what would what would be the real reason? I mean, I understand if somebody is working three shifts and they just have to squeeze everything at once or something like that. But most of us can probably take time and figure out how to do two separate vaccines. And, and so the fact that what you, what your, is it your friend? Yeah, your friend experienced this kind of side effect of combining shingles and COVID doesn't surprise me. I'm sorry about that. All right, my time's up. Um, if you have more questions, put them in the chat. I'll see what I can answer personally. Otherwise, um, we can move on to next week. Thanks, Ashley. Great. Well, it's so good to see all of the familiar faces um, and some new faces as well. You'll see today that I have a friend with me. He, <laughs> my dog had emergency surgery and he's been, despite the cone, still biting at his foot. So he has to be monitored. Um, but uh, my wife will probably come and take him out to take him to the vet soon. So bear with our little visitor. He doesn't ask a lot of questions, uh, which should be good. So let me share my slides. Don't jinx it. <laughs> oh. 
Okay. So today, you know, in thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, um, I really wanted to talk about something that I think doesn't get spoken about often uh, in regard to long COVID, but has been seen as, you know, there was just an article that came out, I think it was in the New York Times that said the five things that you should know if you have long COVID or you should do if you have long COVID. And one of them was be checked for a dysautonomia. And so I think it is becoming a little bit more mainstream and people are understanding more that this is a huge piece of maybe the debility or the disability in long COVID. Um, so I thought it'd be good since many patients and also actually practitioners alike uh, may not know a lot about dysautonomia. This could be an interesting topic to sort of bring up and, and discuss the integrative management of this and, and also kind of what it is, right? How does it affect us? Um, so the a dysautonomia is really like a blanket umbrella term for other um, syndromes, things like postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, like POTS, right? Or neurally mediated hypo hypotension, um, or orthostatic hypotension, they all kind of fall under this umbrella of dysautonomias, which really just breaks down in meaning to that there's a difficulty or dysfunction with the autonomic nervous system. And as you can see in the little picture I put over there on the right, the autonomic nervous system really mediates most of the processes in our body that we don't even think about on a regular basis. And the vagus nerve innervates most body systems as well, most organ systems, and also is what um, sort of man manages the autonomic nervous system is the kind of the easiest way of putting that. So the vagus nerve is the longest nerve in the body. It runs all the way through the middle of the body. Um, and what we've seen in studies is that COVID-19 as a virus actually infects the vagus nerve um, individually. So this is not by secondary means. This is really the virus coming and infecting this vagus nerve, causing inflammation. And then that inflammation is causing a lot of people with lingering symptoms of COVID um, to have dysautonomias. Um, so the symptoms of that are, are pretty widespread. You know, it can be anything from chronic fatigue to things like nausea, brain fog, exercise intolerance. I know that many, when they think of the word POTS or they think of the word dysautonomia, their brain maybe immediately goes to syncope, right? Which is sort of the most severe end of the spectrum when um, you have decreased blood flow to the brain and your body just wants to be horizontal, right? To protect your brain. So the way we have to think about this on a smaller scale is that the body is gonna do everything it can to protect your brain. That's what it's set up for at the expense of pretty much everything else that's a process in the body as well. So what we're seeing on a smaller scale is that people, when they go from laying down or sitting to standing up, they're not getting as much perfusion, right? As much blood flow to their brain. And that's causing these symptoms of um, headaches, chronic fatigue uh, on a little bit of a smaller scale. Let's go to the next slide. So how often does this really impact people um, with, uh, with COVID, right? Um, so this was a case study. And it's also important to remember, too, that most of the time case studies are, uh, are really what you're going to see in COVID research. It's not going to be these longitudinal studies because COVID is, is fairly new. So in this particular one, which was just 20 people, 70% uh, of them are female which is pretty, you know, what we see demographically in long COVID, right? It affects females more than it affects males, is that 15 of them had POTS, three of them had neurocardiogenic syncope, two had orthostatic hypertension. So all of them in this 20 patient case study had some form of dysautonomia, dysautonomia post-COVID, uh, which is really fascinating. You know, also, what's interesting is that four of them had elevated autoimmune or inflammatory markers. So not all of it was coming from an autoimmune sort of cause, probably lesser of the percentage of, of the group of 20. Um, what I found even more interesting and why I think this important, this topic is so important to talk about is that six to eight months following the infection, they still had, um, they still had symptoms. 85% uh, of them had residual symptoms. So this is not something that's just kind of going away, right? You wait a month, two months, and it, it gets better. Um, eight months later, they're still pretty, um, they, they still have a lot of symptoms. 
And then even worse than this was that 60% were unable to return to work. So this is a condition that really accounts for a lot of the disability that we see with long COVID. Hold on. <laughs> okay. So anyway, <laughs> um, so in thinking about the assessment and sort of treatment of, uh, of dysautonomia, so how can we kind of know that we have one, right? How do we know we have one as a patient? What can our provider do as well? Um, so a really easy way um, that you can assess for this is using a 10 minute stand test. So a 10 minute stand test is very simple to do. Any of you can do it in your home with an automatic blood pressure cuff that goes in your arm. Any one of your providers can do it, whether it's primary care or a specialty. Uh, and really it just involves you taking a blood pressure and pulse reading while you're lying down, sitting and then standing for 10 minutes. It's really important that 10 minute piece is important because your heart rate may not go up very high in the first couple of minutes. It may take the whole 10 minutes and it may take far less than that. But really what you're looking for is a difference of 30 in your heart rate or an elevation of 30 in your heart rate from lying down to standing up. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's also good to mention too, though, that just because it's at 28, let's say, or 25 or 29 doesn't mean, oh, well, I don't have a dysautonomia because it wasn't exactly 30. Medicine doesn't really work like that. We would love it too, but that's really not usually the case. If you were to check in on a different day, if, if I'm guessing if it's over 20, it's probably going to be higher than that. Um, and what your body is really doing is that when you do go to stand up, you should have vasoconstriction in the bottom half of your body and your legs, right? To bring the blood flow to your brain. But what happens is that um, because of this dysfunction, your body has to work so much harder to get that blood flow to your brain. So that's why you're seeing that heart rate spike pretty high. And then if you do find that you have a dysautonomia or that's a possibility, one thing that you would want to do is make sure that you don't have some of these other conditions that are that we commonly see with um, with dysautonomias, things like mast cell activation syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, small fiber neuropathy. Small fiber neuropathy, neuropathy is very common post-COVID and it can account for some of like the pains in the extremities, legs. Um, sojourns is another autoimmune condition that can be related to dysautonomias. One thing that you might wanna check out is this multidisciplinary collaborative consensus guidance, which is really well done. It was done by the um, physiatrist organization and uh, it didn't just have physiatrists, it also had people who are neurologists that treat dysautonomias. Um, and they came together and sort of brought all of their management strategies and recommendations for POTS post-COVID. So it's, it's actually a really good guide um, with some useful information and even has some integrative information too, things like acupuncture um, and stuff like that they discuss on there that has been helpful for their patients. So in talking about treatment, right? The treatment is going to be multifactorial, which is like with most difficult things to treat, right? This is not going to be as simple as we just give sort of one drug and we're good to go. Um, we're really going to have to do a few things. So the sort of the foundation of all dysautonomia treatment is going to be increasing salt and fluid. And this is going to be sort of counterintuitive from what we're usually told, right? Because most, most of the time, nutrition wise, we're told, oh, stay away from salt. Salt is bad. In this case, salt is okay. You actually want to get two to three grams of salt a day. And some recommendations are even much higher than that. They're, you know, seven to eight grams of salt a day and, and even more than two liters of fluid, right? So if you're going to increase sodium, you want to increase fluid because the idea is that you want to retain fluid in the blood vessels. You want volume expansion so you can increase that blood pressure. You don't want your blood pressure to fall too low. And then when you increase your blood pressure, you can decrease your heart rate. Dog is licking his foot again. So also compression <laughs> is very important too. Um, and what they've seen in research is not just, we're not talking about kind of soft compression or up to the knee compression. We're talking about waist high compression. Most of the blood pooling is actually in the abdomen um, and not in the lower body. So that's really good to know. If you're looking for some compression, commercial grade compression is okay. Most people will go with something, you know, from Amazon, like a high-waisted legging or something like that can be really helpful. 
But even with this foundation, volume expansion is important, but it's not going to prevent the flares or really reverse the symptoms in a significant way. So it's going to be an important part of management, but it's not the entire picture. So most conventional um, medicine will go to something like a medication, right? Something like a beta blocker um, or even something to improve vasoconstriction like a stimulant or a midodrin. And, and these can be okay um, for a time. And they also have side effects, right? Like any other medication. Furthermore, if the person's really not being managed well and they're still having a lot of symptoms and a lot of debility, then you may want to consider something like IV immunoglobulin, especially if there's an autoimmune component. But all of that also comes with its own side effects. And even further, if you want to take it further, some people will give things like Plaxamil and Rituximab and Methotrexate, all very high side effect medications, which can be helpful, but also can create some high harm and suffering for the patient as well. Um, so when I look at a patient with dysautonomia, which I see many because I see all of the long COVID patients at CIM, and many of them have this, is I try to think of it from different, a different approach, a more integrative approach. So it definitely can't go without saying to consider things like lifestyle factors, right? Not to say lifestyle factors are going to cure um, one's dysautonomia. And they are important though, right? Because if you're not getting enough sleep, you're not eating well, you're very stressed, all your symptoms are going to be exacerbated. So we can't really leave it out. So it is important. And I do look at those things and try to modify them if that's possible. Other things that I do is also look at a functional or cellular um, component of this. I test for micronutrient deficiencies. So I use testing that looks at things like oxidative stress, methylation, to see if... Um, there's anything that we can optimize to help those cellular processes to get rid of the inflammation too, right? Um, so if somebody is deficient in any one of those things, then maybe I can replete that. And from a cellular level, from a stem level, maybe we can get, we can improve some of this inflammation. And then I'm also going to look at what else could be harming their immune system, right? Or causing more inflammation. That can be things like food sensitivities, um, things that, you know, Food-wise, when you eat, your immune system reacts to it inappropriately, and that's creating even more inflammation. So maybe we can get rid of some of those things, right, if we can identify them. And then lastly, which it was great, this was already sort of brought up, is that I look at gut health, um, and, and I look at it with different functional medicine testing, uh, and, and also in some other kind of conventional ways as well, but seeing if we can optimize um, that person's microbiome, mycobiome to um, improve their gut health. Because as we all know, right, the vagus nerve is gonna interact with the gut and the gut interacts with the immune system. So it's hugely important. Um, so if there is some sort of viral persistence or remnants, or there is inflammation, we definitely wanna be kind of treating that stem um, and not just kind of treating the symptoms of dysautonomia. Uh, Cause likely that person won't improve without treating sort of the, the, the root. Um, but other than that, I mean, I would say that many may think that dysautonomia is kind of, uh, you know, a chronic condition that never really goes away or gets better. Uh, and that can be the case. But what I've seen is that patients can really improve. Um, and this definitely isn't some sort of death sentence or, you know, disability, I guess, sentence. Um, you definitely can find ways to get back to doing exercise and being more upright and living a more purposeful, valuable life. So, um, that's all I have. I'm happy to take questions. I'm sorry <laughs> that my dog has been uh, trouble during this. Let's see. Um, oh, yeah, that's great, Finia, that you have it. And yes, EDS, yeah. The poor man's state. Yeah, yeah, that can be a term for it. But I think that sometimes, you know, I worry about that term because I think sometimes it can be looked at as practitioners as being not as diagnostic, right? They're like, well, the person has to have a tilt table test. The problem with getting a tilt table test, as you might know, is that they're very few and far in between. You know, the autonomic nerve, the autonomic um, centers are, there's very few. And usually to get testing, it can take like six months, a year um, at a place like Hopkins, who's going to do most of the autonomic testing. So And they have problems. They're not foolproof. No, no, but, absolutely. But they're not very they're not perfect tests. I've had a lot of people pass through the test just to have a dramatically obvious pots, just because the 
they either are athletes at high level or there's some other features. Like, for example, I had a patient uh, some months ago who had a, a very low heart rate at baseline, like 45, I think, was a baseline. So after COVID became 55, they did a test. She passed it, but I was asking her to do some exercise. In the, and I think I talked about this patient before. I had her do some exercises in the room with me, and it was quite obvious that she was completely out of breath right after. And so, you know, the, it, it, every test has its own problems. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely true. Um, it's definitely not absolute. And I would say that it's it's at a detriment to wait to that to treat it. You know, then you're then the person's really just suffering. and There are ways to manage it. Um, oh, thank you, Monica. <laughs> um, can also be expensive. Yeah, yeah, they can be expensive too. Mm -hmm. um, can sciatica and knee and pain in knee and lower leg be a result of dysautonomia of sickness? I think. So maybe not a result of dysautonomia necessarily, but that could be a comorbidity. It might be more so a result of small fiber neuropathy. So small fiber neuropathy is another um, diagnosis that's not tested as often. And the test is, you know, doing these little biopsies in the leg. Um, and so, yeah, I, I see that quite a bit um, with, with long COVID. So that may be more the case. Um, vagal nerves. Yeah. So there are other vagal nerve therapies that can help. So things like acupuncture can be super helpful. Things like vagal nerve stimulating devices can be helpful. So like gamma core is one of them that stimulates externally, um, with these little electro impulses, right. Um, breathing, right. Lots of breath work stimulates the vagus nerve. Um, things like somatic experiencing works with the autonomic nervous system in the vagus nerve. So humming, gargling, all those things can be really, really helpful. Um, yeah, so yeah, ex Nutrival, yeah, exactly. That could be an option, yeah. Um, I do a lot of, uh, I like GI map. There's GI effects. There's all sorts of gut health tests. Yeah, but, but just, I wanna clarify that. We don't do this test to look for microbiome. I mean, we look for tests to look at the general patterns and also to say there may be dysbiosis, but we, it's not like we're looking at something very specific there because we know that that's quite questionable technology there. There are some minor possible organisms to assess, but in all in all, I would say just the, the, the technology is not there yet. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important. I'm more looking for maybe things that are more pathological, right? And we do pick up on some things that don't get picked up on, things like H. pylori, um, some things that may suggest SIBO, right? That could be interfering. All right. Well, it was so good to be with all of you. I didn't want to cancel on all of you because of my dogs. I'm happy we're at least able to do some of this. Um, I hope it wasn't too disruptive, but uh, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you, Ashley. All right, Tiff. Um, I, I, can I do a little intro? Uh, so... You've been on this before, though, no? Or is this your first time? This is my first time. Okay. So you guys were a very rare treat. Um, to I were, I've been working with Dr. Coyce for many years, and I will attest that she's probably one of the most diagnostically uh, astute physician I've ever worked with. I, I tend to send her a lot of patients just to get an idea, what am I missing? Um, because the way that that sort of someone trained in TCM can appreciate some of the energetic footprints of the person are very profound. And so I hope that um, you have time and then we will have this in a recording so you can do this practices that she's about to teach us. And I'm looking forward to it myself um, in the future. Thanks so much too for doing this. And I hope that we'll see you back here for more things like um, the thing that I'm about to post in the link in this uh, in a chat in a second about your article that you wrote for our newsletter about some key aspects of Ch Chinese medicine nutrition. So I'll put the a link, but I won't take up your, your time. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, we can begin. Thank you. Um, I'm. Dr. Tiffany Hoyt. I study Chinese medicine. Um, I wanted to have a brief intro to what we're going to do today. Um, I originally thought we were going to do some Qigong, and then I thought this is not the practices that I was thinking of were actually not 
ideal for this time of year. Um, China was an agrarian nation for thousands of years, and um, they really paid a lot of attention to seasonality. And um, they collected a lot of data and they were very good at predicting certain things that happened every single year, phenomenological things, like for example, the hatching of midges and the ascending of frost and the return of migrating birds. And um, in, in an effort to codify um, what was happening in the phenomenological world, they developed a whole system of observations that we call chi nodes, and there are 24 of them a year. Each one of them has a different name. As of November 8th, we entered the chi node called Winter is Beginning. Um, and I know in Washington, D.C., it doesn't feel like winter. I think it was 65 degrees yesterday. It certainly felt pretty warm today. That doesn't feel like winter. And um, and in the United States, we often talk about uh, winter being the start at the solstice. And if you realize the solstice is really only six six weeks away from where we are right now, which is surprising. But of course, in the evenings, it gets darker earlier. Um, in Asia, they look at the year divided into um, categorize, they categorize it in terms of yin versus yang. In other words, the way you could look at that is through light. When there's a lot of light, that's more yang. When there's less light, that's more yin. Winter solstice is the apex of yin of the year. And we are called to more stillness and peace at this time of year. And we're also called to change certain facets of our life. And there are recommendations. Once we begin winter, we are supposed to, for example, always make sure that we are warm. Everybody should be wearing a scarf at all times. Even when you step out, even when you're inside your house, you shouldn't have drafts on your head. You should always be wearing warm socks at this time of year. You know, being cold at this time of year is especially stressful. We should always be eating warm food at this time of year. Stews are not only, they're not only enjoyable, but they're essential for keeping us warm and keeping us fluid and um, nourishing us and reminding us that everything takes time. Um, one thing that we should be really careful of is avoiding anger, especially at this time of year, anger and frustration. And when, when we do become frustrated, it's especially taxing for our kidneys. And the kidneys is what replenish themselves when we sleep and when we hibernate. And, and they're especially important at this time of year. Um, in order to avoid frustration, one thing we can do is sit in meditation and meditation training. And um, the kind of meditation I was originally introduced to is called Vipassana, which means clear seeing. And it's called clear seeing, not because you're seeing visions, but because you realize that your thoughts are literally just thoughts. They're not reality. Um, when you sit and you follow the breath, you have a very clear understanding. You can't be without thoughts. The thoughts keep on coming. They're like clouds. Your sky can be perfectly clear and then the clouds just pass. Rather than grabbing onto your thoughts, you just wanna keep the clouds passing, passing by and just let them go. So I'm gonna walk you through Vipassana meditation. I'm gonna give you a little um, information about holding your body, your body position and following your breath. And then uh, we'll sit 
I typically, I was trained in, in, um, in an organization where we don't talk during meditation. So once I start, I'm not going to be saying anything. I might check in 10 minutes in. Um, I see a couple of you are wrapping shawls around yourself. That's fantastic. That's especially great for this time of year. Excellent. And so let's start. In terms of your body, you want to feel like there is a string holding the top of your head up and connecting you to the heavens. You want your back to be completely straight so that your head is suspended right directly over your neck, over your spine, and over your pelvis. If you're sitting in a chair, you want to scoot forward a little bit so that you're stimulating your perineum. You want to make sure that your knees are below your hips. A teacher of mine once said he can tell someone who's a real meditator versus someone who's not a real meditator by the position of their knees in relation to their hips. Your knees should be lower than your hips. Your feet should be flat on the floor. I'm assuming there's no one in, in a cross-legged position, but if you'd like to do that, you can do that too. Just make sure your knees are lower than your hips. Your hands, the palms are on the top of your thighs gently. And your elbows are creased gently. Don't stretch your arms out. That causes um, pain and stress in your lower back and your upper back. Your eyes should not be closed. They should be almost closed, but there should be a little bit of light leaking in. Your mouth should be held soft. Your jaw should be soft maybe a little bit of gap between your lips and your tongue should be on the bottom of your, of your mouth, not on the top of your mouth. And here you wanna turn your attention to the breath and you're following the breath as it rushes into your body and you're following your breath as it rushes out of your body. You're watching it like it's actually water flowing into a canyon and filling up and then flowing out of a canyon and emptying out completely. And when your thoughts do occur to you, just realize they're thoughts. You can label them thinking and let them go. Just let them go. Unhook. and return to the breath.
and inhale. Take your hands, rub your hands together. It's always best if you rub your, your hands together in front of your um, dantian or your lower abdomen. So your hands are pointing down like this. Rub them until they're very, very hot. And when they're very hot, place them over your eyes. Open your eyes, inhale. It moistens the eyes. Tap down the top of your head, the center line. Do it three times. Tap on your upper shoulders, the plane, the place that hurts. Make little fists like this and rub them high on your kidneys 36 times. This is just at the lower edge of your of your rib cage in the back. Pat all over your body, massage your legs, your arms. And welcome back. Thank you, Tiffany. This was delightful. Uh, I think we need to do more silence and meditation. And see, my dogs got really excited at the end when I was starting to hit my kidneys. I think they're, they're thinking something's happening here. Hopefully they're right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Tiffany. Janet, what do we have next week? We are on hike. Oh, that's right. For the we have Thanksgiving. Holiday. Never mind. The oh, week I'm after, I mean. Oh, the week after? Let me go look. And dogs say hello, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, he's cute. <laughs> he's just saying hello, hello in his own way. Right. Okay. Well, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. On December 1st, we will have Niall McFarland and Nina Paul. Nina okay. Paul, and who's the who's the who's doing the wellness talk? Niall McFarland. Very good. Yeah. We'll see. Our Blue Nile. Nile and Nile and, Nile and you know, All right. don't over, don't overeat next week. I'm watching you. <laughs> no, go ahead and overeat. It's actually okay. One time you can overeat. I'm planning on it. Take care, everyone. Bye.